The Trojan War, one of the most well-known stories ever told, is unquestionably the biggest war in classical mythology. And while many refer to it in conversations, hardly a few know the actual story, the nitty-gritty of it. And that forms the purpose of this video, introducing you to the story of the Trojan War. So sit tight and let's begin. A celestial love match and a prophecy about the very pillars of the Olympian order serve as the origins of the Trojan War. In particular, Zeus and Poseidon both fell in love with a lovely sea nymph named Thetis decades before the war began. Both of them desired to wed her, but they both changed their minds after hearing the dire consequences of doing so. It was fated that the sea goddess should bear a princely son, stronger than his father, who would wield another weapon in his hand more powerful than the thunderbolt or the irresistible trident, if she lay with Zeus or one of his brothers. So, as not to risk anything, Zeus decided to give Thetis' hand in marriage to King Peleus. Zeus had a lavish feast to celebrate Peleus and Thetis' union. All other gods were invited, with the exception of Eris, the unfavorable goddess of conflict. Being halted at the entry by Hermes, the irritated goddess flung her present, the apple of discord, a golden apple with the words, for the fairest, engraved on it, among the guests before leaving the party. Soon after, Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite began arguing about who should receive the apple. Unable to reach a consensus among themselves, they asked Zeus to resolve the conflict. Zeus prudently opted to abstain from making a decision, appointing Paris, the youthful prince of Troy, to serve as the judge instead, knowing that any decision would likely offend at least two goddesses. When the three goddesses came to Paris, he was on Mount Ida, tending to his herds. Even after seeing each of the three goddesses naked, he was unable to choose. Hera told Paris that she would give him both political power and the kingdom of Asia as thanks for choosing her. Athena then promised him knowledge and superior fighting prowess. Finally, Aphrodite promised Paris, Helen of Sparta, the most beautiful lady in the entire world. Paris gave the fruit to Aphrodite and left for Sparta to collect his reward. But Helen was already married to Menelaus. Aphrodite took advantage of the time when Menelaus was away attending a funeral to disguise Paris as a diplomatic envoy and successful sneak into the palace of the Spartan royal family. After a night of love and vows, Helen consented to flee with Paris to Troy, under the sway of the goddess and one of Eros's distinctive arrows. Soon after arriving home, Menelaus discovered that his wife had abandoned him and was now with another less deserving man. He wasted little time in invoking the oath of Tyndareus, Helen's father, and enlisting the aid of all Achaean chiefs who had previously sought Helen's hand with him. Odysseus was the wisest counselors of Tyndareus, then embarked on a journey to find and enroll the man fated to become the greatest of all Greek warriors beneath Troy. Achilles was the sole surviving son of Peleus and Thetis, the kid that Zeus and Poseidon had always wished they could never have. Even before he was born, his mother was aware that Achilles would either have a long and uneventful life or a short and heroic one that would conclude with his death in battle. Thetis worried for her son's destiny and resolved to give him immortality. She took him to the River Styx, one of the rivers that flowed through the underworld when he was still a baby, and immersed him there to render him immune to harm. Thetis, however, was unaware that the boy's heels, by which she had held him, did not contact the waters of the Styx. This oversight would later prove to be the reason for Achilles' failure and is the source of the expression Achilles' heel, which today denotes a weak place despite overall strength. However, Thetis disguised Achilles as a female and concealed him among the maidens in the court of King Lycomedes of Skyros when she had finished the procedure in order to be even safer. Odysseus discovered Achilles' location shortly after joining the Trojan expedition. He then linked up with Telamonian Ajax and Phoenix, a former student of Achilles and the three traveled to Skyros to find the hero. There, they either appeared as traitors offering gems and weapons, with Achilles being the only lady interested in the latter, and they sounded a battle horn, upon the sound of which only Achilles took a spear in hand. Regardless of Achaean troops, were now fully assembled and prepared to invade Troy. The Achaeans promptly set sail for Troy without knowing the precise route. As a result, they unintentionally landed too far to the south, in the kingdom of Messiah, under the leadership of King Telephus. The ensuing conflict claimed the lives of many distinguished Greek warriors, illuminating Achilles' extraordinary strength. Although being just 15 at the time, Achilles managed to kill a large number of Mysians and injure their ruler Telephus, a descendant of Heracles. And this wound was so special that only the one who caused it could heal it. While on the route, they attacked the island of Tenedos, and Achilles murdered Tenes, the king of the island, who also happened to be the son of the deity Apollo, without knowing who he was. The Greek navy traveled a short distance from Tenedos to Troas, and finally reached its target after years of wandering. Everyone was now hesitant to land, though for an oracle had previously said that the first Greek to set foot on Trojan territory would perish in the conflict. It was Protesilaus who had the unfortunate distinction of dying in a face-to-face -face confrontation with Troy's most illustrious hero, its adored prince, Hector making him the war's first casualty. The Trojans successfully withstood the nine-year siege by maintaining trade connections with neighboring Asian towns and receiving continuous reinforcements. The weary Achaean army asked to go home at the conclusion of the ninth year, but Achilles raised their spirit and persuaded them to stay a little longer. The Trojans began to triumph in battle after battle when Achilles withdrew from the war. 
finally forcing the Greeks back to their ships and nearly setting them afire. Achilles' best buddy, Patroclus, who couldn't stand it any longer, requested Achilles' armor and then assumed his identity to seize control of the Myrmidon army. With their spirits raised, the Achaeans successfully repelled the Trojan assault. Ever the fearless warrior and never one to back down from a duel, Hector barely spared a moment before running in the direction of the man everyone assumed to be Achilles. In the fight that followed, Hector managed to kill his opponent, only to discover that it had actually been Patroclus the entire time. Achilles, furious with grief, vowed retribution. With him back on the battlefield, the fight changed drastically and he finally got the fight he craved after killing a large number of Trojans. Even though this combat featured the strongest warriors from both armies, everyone understood that there could only be one winner. In fact, before the fight even started, Hector bid his wife Andromache and his little son Astyanax farewell after learning the extent of his opponent's deity status. Achilles killed Hector, but instead of giving his body to the Trojans to be buried, he desecrated it by dragging it in front of the city walls with his chariot. After being brought to tears by King Priam of Troy's visit, who had gone by himself to the Greek camp to request the body of his son together with his son's killer, he ultimately decided to surrender it. After these incidents, Achilles didn't survive very long, because when he attempted to enter Troy, an arrow launched by Paris and directed by Apollo struck him in the heel. Later, his bones were combined with those of his close friend, Patroclus, and burned at a funeral pyre. Odysseus came up with a strategy to permanently put an end to the conflict. He requested the construction of a hollow-bellied wooden horse. Soldiers were concealed inside the horse as it was ridden up to Troy city gates. A double agent called Sinon was left behind when the Greek navy went to the adjacent islands of Tenedos. After considerable thought, Sinon persuaded the Trojans that the Greeks had left and that the Trojan horse was a heavenly gift that would bring Troy tremendous prosperity. The Trojans led the horse into the city against the warnings of Cassandra, a prophetess, and Laocoon, a priest of Apollo. They then began dining and toasting their success. The Greek ships did, however, return throughout the night, and the men who had been hiding within the horse sprang out to unlock the gates. After a bloodbath and a conflict that lasted 10 years, Troy finally succumbed. In addition to raiding the city and setting most of it on fire, the Greeks also committed offense after offense against the Olympian gods by demolishing temples and holy sites. Neoptolemus, the son of Achilles, brutally murdered King Priam, and Queen Hecuba either became Odysseus' slave or lost her mind after witnessing the bodies of many of her children. One of her daughters, Polyxena, was sacrificed at Achilles' grave, while another, Cassandra, was attacked by the Locrian Ajax after being pulled from Athena's temple in a deplorable crime that caused the goddess's statue to look away in horror. Hector's little son, Astyanax, was killed by being thrown off the walls of Troy by either Neoptolemus or Odysseus in what is arguably the cruelest act of them all. And then, the end begins. It would go something like this. The gods seldom forgive and never forget. The remaining Greek heroes will discover this the hard way. Despite their triumph, the majority of them will suffer brutally for their sins. In actuality, only a few people will ever return home. And even then, only after great adventures. Even fewer will receive a warm welcome. Instead, they will either be banished into obscurity or perish at the hands of their loved ones, or both, in certain situations. So this was the story of the Trojan War. We hope you got the chills too, as we did when making this video. You can like and subscribe to keep us motivated by bringing more of such storytelling content to you in the future. See you next time. Till then, stay mythically mad.